five days into the federal election campaign and things look a lot different than they did in 2019. From the masks to the elbow bumps, it's hard to escape the pandemic reality. And it's already led to some tense moments on the streets. Are you here to unmask our children? Are you here to unmask our children? Smaller or virtual events have so far replaced large rallies and the leaders are traveling less too. Still, some familiar issues are already making their way into this election. So what kind of impact is this having on the leader's momentum or lack thereof? How's the campaign playing out in these first number of days? It's Thursday and I'm here with At Issue. Chantal Hébert, Andrew Coyne, Althea Raj and Elamin Abdul Mahmoud, who's going to join us for the duration of the campaign. So that's good. Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to start with you this week, Althea. T tell me what strikes you in these first few days of the campaign in terms of the tone and, and how different it, it seems to be. Well, I mean, it's harder to, as you said in the introduction, campaign during COVID when you are not allowed to have big crowds. So that sense of momentum is kind of gone. I'd say um, from the looks of it, Jagmeet Singh seems to be having a pretty good campaign, but the Liberals and the Conservatives are trying to squeeze them out of the debate. Um, the Liberals who chose this election timing seem actually the least prepared for it. I think partly that might be because Afghanistan has kind of taken the wind from their sails or changed the discussion somewhat. But um, the conversation they wanted to have about how to build back better and them versus the Conservatives, uh, they have not had a great week. Uh, I would say for all their efforts in trying to um, redefine Aaron O'Toole or to define Aaron O'Toole in um, the, the minds of voters, many of whom had no idea who he was, as an anti-vaxxer, as an anti-choice, as an anti-woman's right. I'm not sure those things are landing. Uh, the Conservatives have had a really good week. They released their platform. He's a big spending Conservative who promises not to raise taxes. We'll see how that goes. Um, but I think that Aaron O'Toole could be very pleased with this performance this week. Uh, OK, Chantal, same, same to you. And, and maybe speak to that decision by the Conservatives to release a platform in these early days. It's happened before, but it's a different kind of strategy. It's happened before, probably never recently as quite as early as yeah. in this campaign. But uh, it is a smart move because what it does is it allows the Conservative Party to shift Aaron O'Toole from uh, chief critic of the government to prime minister in waiting. Hmm. Uh, uh, and it provides, rather than give people every day some piece of a puzzle, and at some point in the last campaign, the Conservatives unveiled their entire platform after the debates. Yeah. Uh, so it was a completely different campaign. They believed that they could ride this on, on carbon pricing. Uh, and so why get distracted by the rest of it? it? It worked only up to a point, given the results. But I agree with Althea. If you're going to call an election that uh, most Canadians are not convinced is needed, you need to hit the ground running. And that is not what the Liberals have done this week. I don't believe that anything that happened this week is going to be totally significant to the result. But yeah. uh, for the Liberals, it was a bit of a wasted week. Andrew, what, what is your thinking on where we are at this point? Uh, I would echo my colleagues, I think the Liberals look rattled. Uh, the Prime Minister is not, I think, on his game. He's looked over the top in some of his rhetoric. He's looked careless in others, for example, when he said he didn't care about monetary policy. Uh, and there's been, a, a, I think, a definite tightening in the polls. Mm -hmm. uh, before the election, you were seeing polls of at least five, as much as 14 points. You've had a spate of them now showing like maybe one, two, three points between the parties. Uh, I think Partly, Aaron O'Toole benefits from having such low expectations coming into this. I mean, they couldn't be lower. And if you show up and you don't have horns on, oftentimes in politics, uh, as Justin Trudeau proved in 2015, you can benefit from that. Um, I think they've also benefited from their platform. I don't like it as policy. I think it's a grab bag of uh, gimmicks and, and, and uh, utterly complacent on the deficit and the debt and on the long run growth of the economy versus the short run. But there's no doubt that it's uh, fairly shrewd politically and that it does give the Liberals a lot of targets to shoot for, paints Aaron O'Toole and the party as a kind of a pocketbook-based party, uh, gives them things to talk about each day, as Chantal was saying, coming out of the block, they've got their platform ready and waiting for them. And I'll just close on this is, you know, every opposition party casts around for a bit looking for a leader who's sufficiently shameless uh, to get them into power. Uh, and I'm not saying they're going to get into power, 
but Aaron O'Toole is showing he has the requisite shamelessness. Okay, well, we'll, we'll talk more about that in, in the next uh, section, but I want to get Elamin to, to weigh in on, on your impressions of this first week. I mean, I think maybe the thing that we're all reacting to is that there doesn't seem to be a message. There doesn't seem to be a message from most of these leaders so far. I would say that uh, the NDP and Jagmeet Singh have so far had the clearest articulation of what their priorities are. But, you know, we got that large uh, conservative platform 165 pages later. There isn't a defining policy that says this is what we're about. There is a grab bag there. Yeah. There are things to pay attention to, but also a lot of things to poke at. And I, I think that kind of leaves, whether it's the liberals or the conservatives, kind of exposed. And the idea that these parties were ready and waiting for this election and now we're here and there isn't this clear message, that seems surprising to me. But also, it is August, and I'm not sure that anyone is paying attention. I am desperately waiting for the day after Labor Day when maybe something will pique all of our interest. But, you know, if you put out your platform on day two and there's you're not generating the, the kind of headlines that you'd be expecting, maybe that, sign, maybe that signals trouble, I think. Uh, Chantal, I think that's uh, in there. Then I'll go to Althea. Yeah. Jean Chrétien unveiled this Red Book uh, a few days in the in into the campaign in uh, 1993, I think eight days, uh, so just a bit longer. And at first it didn't create, you know, it didn't move the needle on the poles. But over time, and these things do take time, and I agree with the August thing. So I would circle September 2nd as the official date of the really real campaign, because that is when the TVA debate in French will take place followed the week after by debates in French and English. And I believe that uh, at that point, when kids are back in school, people will be paying attention. But I, I totally agree that uh, this week and possibly next week are treading water week. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean there is no ground, ground grain, gain, though. Yeah, yeah, and, and I'll just, so I'll just set an alarm on my calendar. September 2nd <laughs> is when we should all, um, Althea. <laughs> I would say just a flag, though, that this election might be a little bit different because of the large amount of mail-in ballots that right. uh, right. everybody expects. And so if you are expecting your supporters, you know, in traditionally you would get them out to advance polls so you can focus on those identified voters that may not be your core supporters on Election Day. If you're hoping that all your core supporters vote by mail and that all your IDs that you've been doing for the past six, eight months, uh, get out there and vote early so you can cross them off your list and focus on other people, that might change your communication yeah. strategy as well. For sure. Uh, last word to you, I think yeah. I think there's another reason why things might really move come September. Um, there's a lot of free-floating anxiety out there to do with the pandemic and otherwise, and the mm -hmm. parties are sort of trying to tap into this to figure out what kind of anxiety is. Is it about the economy? Is it about the health care? Is it about daycare? Is it about yeah. the outside world? Is it about the disease itself? Um, I think nobody really knows at this point because one of the features of the pandemic is we've all been kind of isolated and alone. But as people start to come back, as people go back to school, as people return to their workplaces and they start comparing notes with each other, mm. uh, some of that, those individual impressions might start to congeal and you might start, see a start to see a movement in one direction or another. I have no idea which way, yeah. but it might be a bigger move than we might expect. That's a, that's a good mm. point, too. I'm pro-choice and we will make sure that women have the ability to make decisions with respect to their health care themselves and make sure that abortion services are available from one coast, from one ocean to the other. I think it's very clear that uh, the Conservatives, Conservative Party once again doesn't understand what pro-choice actually means. Pro-choice isn't the power for doctors to choose, it's the power for women to choose. So yeah, the abo abortion issue emerged again on the campaign trail today. I say again because it seems to happen in every election. The Liberals raising questions about conscience rights mentioned in the Conservative Party platform that would allow medical professionals to make decisions about what they're willing to do. Except unlike in 2019, this Conservative leader, as you heard there, has said he is pro-choice. So uh, how did we end up back here yet again? Chantel, Andrew, Althea and Elamine all back for another round. I'm going to start with you on this one, Elamine. Then I'm going to go to you, Andrew, because I wonder if this is what you were referring to earlier about Aaron O'Toole. But Elamine, are you surprised to see this playing out again in spite of the fact that Aaron O'Toole early on positioned himself as, as pro-choice? Not at all. Uh, I'm not surprised that this issue is coming up this early. I mean, Chantel earlier mentioned the Red Book. Look, um, the Conservatives don't have the Red Book. They have 
Aaron O'Toole on the cover of their platform. And that opens them up to being defined, being talked about in this way. Um, and one of the one of the key ways that the liberals can do, are able to do, as they did last time, is talk about the abortion issue. I still don't understand why the conservatives are not running with the conservative brand above the leader. I think that's certainly a stronger brand in this country. But the minute that you try to put a leader out there and a face out there, you know, it's they're going to open him up to being defined by the liberals in this way, and they're trying it again. Andrew? Um, political parties often like to pretend they have larger differences than they actually do uh, for mutual reasons. So, for example, mm -hmm. on the vaccine mandate, uh, each of them was playing to their base with their rhetoric, but if you actually examine the policy, you know, the liberals' policy is you have to get a vaccine unless you get tested, and the Tory policy is if you get tested, you don't have to get a vaccine, but they wind up being basically the same. You have to either be vaccinated or tested. And I can see Mr. O'Toole doing something of the same with the abortion issue or with this uh, uh, conscience rights issue, where, um, look, the status quo is doctors are not required to perform abortions or, or um, assist to it, et cetera. They are required to provide effective referrals. If you look at the Tory platform, they say, we're going to protect conscience rights of doctors. They don't actually say how far they're going to. If it's just the status quo, if that's all they're really uh, uh, advocating, then the liberals are in a hard position of saying, would they change the status quo? Would they force doctors to perform abortions? Of course they wouldn't. So the distinction, the difference here is more to do with the emphasis and the rhetoric and may not actually be that substantive. But I think he may, with that in his resolutely pro-choice stand, he may have uh, blunted the liberals' attempt to try to make this a wedge issue. Yeah, I mean, did, has he left himself open to this, though, Chantal, because because there are parts of his party that he does have to keep happy with, on these issues. Yes, a majority of his MPs did not vote like him against a, a bill that some would say uh, was meant to reopen the debate on abortion. Uh, the same could be said about conversion uh, therapy. Uh, and on his way to go to Andrew's point about Aaron O'Toole being uh, willing to say anything that he needs to say when he needs to say it uh, to score points, he did spend the leadership campaign telling uh, conservative members who are social conservatives, you'll have a, a, a big space in my party and you will be free to try to bring mm -hmm. these bills. Uh, and Peter McKay, my main rival, will not do that for you. So yeah. having courted them, He's kind of paying the price for that. I do agree with Andrew that I think by saying he is pro-choice uh, up front, this will not last as long, I believe, as it did in the last campaign with Andrew Scheer. But, but you can see, Althea, that the liberals will try and drag this out as long as possible because it's, it's, a, it's a wedge that has worked for them in the past. It has. I would remind everybody that actually it's not the Liberals who brought this up. It's Aaron O'Toole who brought this up. Right, uh, yes. In announcing his Quebec platform, he chose to say he was pro-choice several times. Um, and so I think in some ways that was the Conservatives, to Andrew's point earlier, that, that you know hardly anybody is paying attention, wanting to know what the Liberals had in their arsenal to come at them with. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like round one on the abortion issue, right. but round two and round three are probably going to come much later during this campaign. Because to Chantal's point, and she's she is right, and Aaron O'Toole has yet to ask answer this question, is when you have the majority of your caucus, two-thirds of his caucus, voted in favor of pro-life bill, a bill that sought to criminalize doctors who performed sex-selective abortion. Even in his own caucus, he was told, you cannot regulate a sex selective abortion, how will you do this? This will make abortions much more difficult. 30 people, in his, uh, 30 members of his shadow cabinet voted against him. So Aaron O'Toole on one side with the Liberals and the rest of the Conservative caucus on the other. And when you have um, the pro-life movement that is uh, entering nomination battles, uh, electing candidates, and then knowing that that is the only way by electing MPs, conservative MPs, that they can change the law, that is their mission. They're going to Ottawa with that mission. How can Aaron O'Toole promise that a conservative government would not um, would not introduce uh, any abortion restrictive measures if, if he's giving the green light to his caucus members to do that? And he has yet to distance himself from that position. La last word to you. Well, he yeah, yeah let go ahead, Andrew. Yep. He can absolutely promise that the government won't introduce a bill. He won't whip a bill in favor of it. Uh, he won't whip them against a guess, is what he's saying. So it would, be a, it would only be a private member's bill. That's basically the status quo. It's entirely fair for people to bring that up and for people for whom that's a big issue to ask their local candidates how they stand on it. 
But I don't think it's fair to say that a, that a, a O'Toole government would bring in a bill. I think it's very clear they wouldn't. L last word. To I you understand, such. but to yeah. most people, when they see that, they cannot tell the distinction whether the majority of the conservative MPs vote in favor of a private member's bill or Aaron O'Toole's minister brings forward a bill. It, yeah. it means the same thing to them. I shan't tell some last of word. the yep. um, some of the uh, <laughs> bills that the unions describe as anti-unions from the previous conservative government started mm -hmm. off as private members' bills and then made That's their right. way to the Senate because they passed in the House of Commons. So yeah. um, that, yes, he is trying to have it both ways, and I don't think that's sustainable. Okay, i got to leave it there. Thank you all. We have many more weeks ahead and, and many more, much more time together. Thank you so much. Chantal, Andrew, Althea, and Elamine. Appreciate it.